My name is uh, Michael John Wilkinson and I did national service from 1953 to 1955. Oh, well, I was just interested. I think it's a new experience, and I was interested in having a new experience. I, I, I didn't view it with foreboding. He'll be back. On the train, John tries hard to settle down to reading, but somehow he can't concentrate. The words jump up and down on the page. And I caught the train and uh, we came up through um, a member of Church Stretton and I thought, oh, this is wonderful, what wonderful, superb country. Anyway, so we ended up at uh, Padgate and the idea of Padgate was just to provide you with uh, clothing and get you ready for what? Um, and I say this um, uh, for initial training because I'd never thought of it as initial training and I, uh, it, we thought of square bashing and somebody said to me, what's square bashing? No, square bashing, and I never really thought of it as square bashing. It was a name that didn't sink in, bashing the square. It was just something you did, square bashing. So yeah, so they prepared you for uh, square bashing. So after about a week or less than that, probably at Padgate, uh, I was sent um, to uh, Hennesford, or Hensford, I believe it's pronounced locally, but it's near Rugeley. You didn't know where you were going to go, but anyway, I went to Hansford. And um, then it, it was all tough then. Everybody shouted at you and, uh, you know, you were in the billet. And um, it was at that time that people who had come straight from home were really suffering because being yelled and screamed at and do this and do that. And, um, and there was a, a quite a lot of crying and um, very occasionally during square bashing people committed suicide. In fact, I understood that whilst I was there, a couple did that. But um, um, to me it was okay. But I could well understand how other people felt. And uh, so, yes, we got yelled and screamed at and, and most of the time was spent a marching. So it was marching up and down and of course some people found it difficult because they didn't know the difference between their left and right foot or they had flat feet or something like that and they their lives were really made hell because these um, drill instructors um, were real toughies. <laughs> The men of the RAF regiment undergoing realistic training at their regimental depot, Cattery. They are young national servicemen, and it's all part of the grueling business of becoming an efficient soldier. The aircraft have dropped a force of enemy parachutists on the east side of the airfield. There's no need to say, let battle commence. Paratroopers now make a determined move to cross the river. Object of the RAF regiment formed in 1942 is to provide a highly trained nucleus of fighting men for the ground defense of RAF airfields and installations at home and abroad. By a smoke screen, the paratroopers, having crossed the river, reorganize on the far side and now move in to assault the position. The tide of battle ebbed and flowed, but in the end, we're glad to say tables were turned, the counterattack was successful, and all paratroopers were either captured or killed. So lie down, you're dead. Well, not for long anyway. War is war, and young recruits are very human young men. And somewhere in the distance, they smell not battle, but a nice cup of char. They decided that I was going to be um, 
a radar mechanic. I didn't know anything about radar or electronics, but anyway, they said radar mechanic. And so they sent me to Yatesbury um, near Carn in Wiltshire. And uh, that was pretty demanding. You had to do a course before you went abroad. Well, they said, you have been posted to Egypt, to the canal zone. And uh, I was quite pleased about that because I knew you got what they called a local overseas allowance, whereas if you were posted to Germany, you didn't. I think it was about three shillings a week, something like that. I know the actual um, salary or wage at that time was 28 shillings a week. And so, uh, and I tried to save four shillings a week, um, put it away. Um, but uh, anyway, so I posed the canal zone and I thought, well, that's interesting. Yes, I, I didn't know anything about it. So, uh, yeah. The Suez Canal Zone continues to be a Middle East trouble spot, with British troops playing a familiar role of rounding up terrorist suspects to keep peace and order. Our ever-increasing garrison keeps up a tireless search for hidden weapons. Even in the walls of houses, the troops seek for arms to prevent further attacks, which have already cost many British lives. Meanwhile, the vital waterway remains open for traffic until an Anglo-Egyptian agreement is reached on the canal zone and the future status of the Sudan. Uh, I remember very clearly the going flying in the night and looking down on the pyramids and I thought that was very exciting. So anyway, we flew there and I was posted to um, a place next door to the, uh, the airfield uh, called uh, RAF Abyad and uh, Abyad was the place where they had called 109 MU, 109 Maintenance Unit. And uh, so we were supposed to do some maintenance, but uh, we did radar and there wasn't any radar there to be maintained. And so we just helped doing this and that, helping um, deliver things, repair things, and give, gave me a lot of, uh, appreciation of how difficult it could be for other people. But on the other hand, I mean, we did have difficult times. The, the Egyptians were out to get us if they could, and we had guards. We had a big fence around, and we weren't allowed out of the camp. And um, we would, so uh, we did um, two hours on and four hours off. And that wasn't so bad for 12 hours, but if you're doing 24 hours and you had these little sort of um, places with behind um, uh, sacks of sand and um, you were just m making sure that they weren't trying to get in um, through the fence. But they did on occasion and they ran off with things. So hadn't been there that long and they decided that we should fly off in um, Vickers Varsity to Amman in Jordan because uh, our job was to maintain radar but the, but the particular one we were going to maintain was a mobile radar in two parts. This was very nice so we, we had this uh, uh, RAF camp at Amman um, just on the edge of the uh, uh, civil airport and there was um, also an RAF uh, squadron there, 249 squadron, and they were converting from vampires to venoms. And um, anyway, so we spent some time um, maintaining and generally playing around with this uh, set of uh, aerials. And um, then they decided that, uh, okay, you've done that, so what we want to do now is take you off to Iraq. So um, we caught another flight to um, uh, a camp, big camp called, uh, we pronounced it Habania, Habania. No, sorry, we pronounced Habania, but it's normally pronounced Habania. 
And um, so we went there. We uh, stayed in uh, Iraq until it was time for me to go home. And so then uh, I flew back in another Hastings, um, back to the Canal Zone and was there for a week or two, um, just tidying things up. And uh, then I went on a, a troop ship from Port Side back to, um, to here, to um, Liverpool. And it was on the uh, troop ship called the Empire Hallidale. And that took uh, about three weeks. And um, I remember it was pretty rough. I suppose it would be in, in uh, February. Um, and um, so I was seasick for a lot of the time. But, um, and then I, that was for Liverpool, and then we um, went from a station on the, on the coast there somewhere near uh, Blackpool down to Innsworth in Gloucestershire to be discharged. And that was the end of that. I do understand that I was one of a relatively small minority that enjoyed it. Um, other people I've known have been absolutely bored to death, couldn't wait to get out of it. But uh, no, I'm very fortunate, you know, to go to three countries in the, in the mi Middle East. And the other thing was I learned about electronics and uh, I became very interested. I mean, one of the things that arose as a direct result, I mean, I rewired this house and I would never have been able to do that if I hadn't done national service. I cycled, like last week, for instance, I cycled uh, 130 miles um, and I'm 87 next week. But um, uh, it's easier cycling now because I haven't got so much else to do. But I've cycled 100 miles a week for a long, long time.